So, good afternoon, morning, evening to you, wherever you are joining us from. Uh, so nice to see as many of you join us today. My name is Ruby Golo, Executive Director for Global Chamber here in Accra, Ghana. A um, few housekeeping rules. Uh, we will appreciate it if you could keep your microphones on mute unless you are called to speak. Um, you are all encouraged to use the chat box to uh, share your contact details, and you can use that as well uh, during the Q&A section uh, to ask your questions. Um, for those joining us for the first time, Global Chamber supports cross-border trade uh, through warm introductions. We are the only uh, chamber located in about 198 countries and operating from 525 metros across the world. Membership is open to all. And so if you like what we do here today uh, and want to know how you can join our global tribe, uh, then do please get in touch uh, with me or speak with our deputy director, Ingrid, uh, who is also in the audience. Um, on this note, I would like to introduce our guest, moderator, Dr. Sarita Jackson. Uh, she's based in Los Angeles, US. She's the president and the CEO of uh, Global Research Institute of International Trade, a US-based think tank and consulting firm. Her work focuses on customized uh, market research and strategies to help US companies expand to overseas markets, especially to Africa and Latin American regions. So for those interested in exploring the US market, with your product, she's a very good resource person uh, for you to connect with on LinkedIn. Dr. Jackson, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, the floor is yours, please take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Ruby, and hello to everyone. Uh, and as Ruby mentioned that I am based in the United States and I am in on the West Coast, so it's quite early here in Los Angeles, California. And so as Ruby mentioned, I'm Dr. Sarita Jackson. I also serve on the advisory board. I'm an advisory board member, member of the Global Chamber of Los Angeles and the president CEO of the Global Research Institute of International Trade. I'm really excited to serve as your moderator for today's event focused on a key program designed to promote trade between the United States and the Sub-Saharan African region. And that program is the African Growth and Opportunities Act, otherwise referred to as AGOA. And for over 15 years, I have engaged in promoting awareness about AGOA and advising companies on leveraging the opportunities of AGOA, starting with my consulting work in Cabaroni, Botswana for the Southern African region and doing the same for US-based companies interested in, in importing goods from the region Region into the United States so that they can save on duties as a result of this AGOA program. And it remains my passion to bring more awareness about AGOA via events such as this and work one on one with companies located in eligible AGOA countries such as Ghana to take advantage to of the opportunity to access the US market duty-free and quota-free under AGOA before it expires in 2025, which our panelists will explain in more detail and develop a systematic approach to expanding to and growing in the US market. So let's connect after today's event. My contact information will be in the chat. But without further ado, I would like to welcome our panelists, starting with George Finn. George Finn is a trade policy director with the USAID funded Feed the Future Ghana Trade and Investment Activity. George has an extensive experience in public sector policy and management for over 20 years, focusing on trade and industrial policies, regional integration, promoting private sector development and competitiveness, trade capacity building, imports, exports, themes which cover tariffs and non-tariff measures, customs laws and regulations, ports and customs procedures, and documentation. Prior to signing on to the Ghana Trade and Investment Activity at the beginning of this year of 2022, George served as the trade 
Africa private sector specialist with the USAID Monitoring, Evaluation, and Technical Support Services Project, and worked on the implementation of the U.S. Ghana Trade Africa Initiative from February 2016 to September 30th of 2018. This initiative sought to improve Ghana's business environment to promote expanded trade and investment opportunities between Ghana and the United States. George has also served in different roles as Director for Import-Export Policy and Director for Policy Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation at the Ghana Ministry of Trade and Industry for many years. So welcome, George. Next, I would like to introduce Julius Bradford Lamptey. Mr. Lamptey works at the as the head of research and advocacy at the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, a business support organization with a legislative mandate to promote and protect commercial and industrial interests in the country. He is responsible for designing and implementing research goals and strategies, as well as initiating business advocacy and policy dialogues aimed at ensuring an enabling business environment. Currently, he is the project coordinator for the Business Skills and Development Program targeted at 1,000 at 1, small and mid-sized enterprises, which is a collaboration between the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Development Bank Ghana to empower SMEs with the requisite business skills to scale up their business operations and de-risk them to access long-term capital. He is also the coordinator for AGOA Trade Resource Center in Ghana that engages the private sector for regional and global trade assistance via trade intelligence, export development, business promotion and trade facilitation. Mr. Lamptey is an inspiring, creative, analytic, analytical and resourceful person who works with passion coupled with great organization or coordination abilities in achieving results. He has a good working experience in both academia and the corporate sector. He has participated in a number of key local and international research projects, and he is also the driving and mobilizing support for some key projects of the chamber, including Business Pulse, agricultural value chain mapping, diagnostics and design, industry profiling, and the trade indices and data derivatives project. His areas of interest include data and policy analysis, research and evaluation, industry competitiveness, business and investment promotion, export development, and financial markets. So welcome, Mr. Lamptey. So we Thank will you very go much. ahead. You're very welcome. So thanks to both of you for participating in this important discussion about AGOA. And we'll go ahead and get started. So my first question is directed to George Finn. George, if you can explain to us what exactly is AGOA and what are its key policy objectives? Um, thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Jackson. Um, and thank you for your kind uh, warm words of introduction. Uh, just before uh, answering your question, I would also like to indicate that I've been associated with AGOA for many, many years. I was part of the team that worked on Ghana's eligibility for AGOA in the early 2000s. I was part of the team that worked on Ghana's AGOA visa system that enabled Ghana to qualify for export of apparel to the US. Uh, I've also worked with uh, Julius uh, here with me uh, on going around in different regions in Ghana to organize the uh, AGOA awareness and sensitization. So I think uh, it's good that we are all here to promote and support uh, AGOA. I haven't said that. Um, I would also want to indicate that uh, my project, that is a uh, the Future Ghana Trade and Investment Activity, is also promoting uh, AGOA uh, right together with various private sector uh, operators. Now, <clears throat> what is AGOA? Uh, AGOA, I would say, has been the centerpiece of US commercial investment engagement with Sub Saharan Africa. 
before the enactment of AGOA in the year 2000, uh, it was realized that US uh, relationship with Sub-Saharan Africa uh, was on the low side in terms of commerce. And so to put US on a better footpath and then more engaging with Sub-Saharan Africa, AGOA was enacted as a legislation that would uh, promote trade and investment by offering duty-free and quota-free access to uh, African exporters. Uh, if, for example, you take uh, April, uh, which has an average duty rate of maybe around 15 to 25%, somebody exporting to uh, US on the Algoa would receive the items without the payments of uh, duties and taxes. And so that benefit goes to improve the profit of that particular businesses, just as it also improves the competitiveness of our exporters. So <clears throat> AGOA is not just a piece of legislation as one might look at it, but it is actually a development tool to promote uh, poverty reduction, improve standard of living, particularly for women and youth, to the extent that AGOA does not only focus on big companies, but also focuses on women-led and youth-led uh, businesses. What is the policy objective? Policy objective merely is to promote and expand a more vibrant uh, trade and investment engagement between US and Sub-Saharan Africa, also to promote democratization, better reforms, to improve the enabling environment, both for local businesses and then for US. So you are looking at it in terms of a more mutually beneficial uh, sort of a tool that will help us to enhance uh, our competitiveness both ways. Uh, Agua hasn't stopped that. Agua has gone forward to promote a more vibrant uh, engagement at the highest level between South South Africa and US through the uh, National Agua Forum. Uh, AGUA provide other, other benefits, uh, including uh, using the US OPIC and then US commercial services to support businesses both ways. So uh, in terms of policy agenda, AGUA is much more encompassing uh, than it would normally look uh, at the surface. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And so if I may just to summarize or just to highlight some key points for our audience, one thing that you said that is very, very important to take away that, you know, that AGOA is not just about the, the corporations or large corporations, but that you mentioned that it is a development tool that is it is more to AGOA and, and it has an impact on economic development and the components on what it means for women, -owned, female owned businesses, the youth and reducing poverty. Another area that you mentioned, which is going to lead to my next question, you mentioned about the democratization. So kind of the, the policy side of things. And I know that's one of the components when we talk about eligibility. So if you can expand on for AGOA eligible countries, those countries that are able to take advantage of AGOA, what are the eligibility requirements? Uh, thank you very much. Um, in terms of uh, eligibility requirements, one cardinal requirement is that uh, any beneficial country must be seen to be adopting or uh, taking uh, measures to promote market-based economic principles, uh, must also uh, espouse the rule of law, uh, protection of uh, intellectual property rights, uh, protection, protection of workers' rights, uh, also uh, observing uh, protocols that would uh, uh, undermine, that will not undermine uh, international security. It is also uh, required to ensure that any activity that uh, promotes more feasance 
within the public sector in terms of corruption is something that uh, Agua France upon. And so countries are encouraged uh, through Agua to be espousing these principles, uh, enhancing democratic principles. Any activity that's supposed to undermine these legal criteria uh, it means that there is a revocation of Agoa eligibility, as has happened in other jurisdictions. Maybe uh, we may say uh, currently Ethiopia, Guinea, Mali, because of abuses of human rights, uh, that requirement or that uh, eligibility has been revoked. Great. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So basically, with maintaining some of these democratic principles under AGOA, and one key that you, one key thing that you mentioned, and another takeaway is that not all of the sub-Saharan African countries are AGOA eligible. They must follow these principles. But even some countries, and you've just mentioned a few, that were AGOA eligible can lose their status if they're found in violation of these principles. So thank you so much for sharing that. And now my next question is for Julius with regard to Ghana in particular. And if you can share your observations, what have been your observations in terms of AGOA improving trade between the United States and Ghana specifically? Thank you very much. And I really appreciate the opportunity given the chamber, um, the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry to share its perspective on this um, very important topic and also the platform provided us where we could connect with um, this diverse business um, operators and also policymakers as, as well as key stakeholders in, in the global community space. And so for us as a chamber, right from the onset that um, this Ghana uh, became um, eligible um, to export uh, duty free and also quota free. That there was a need to see how best um, the capacities of SMEs are built upon, and so that they can access the market. And so, um, the various activities were done um, this with the Ministry of Trade and Industry, where uh, this Mr. Jackson worked over there, which he has shared his experience. So, and so um, we felt that there was a need to enhance um, skills training for these SMEs. So, and so um, that remains with the, uh, the USAID West Africa Trade and Investment Hub, mainly to help um, um, boost the awareness of AGOA for, for, for our businesses and then also to deepen institutional linkages also to create market access and then to, to be able to help them um, assess um, um, this duty free quota free um, opportunity so in there we organized um, just in several programs um in Accra, Star Credit, and also Kumasi trying to help um, our SMEs uh, be able to understand what is um, Agua and how they can be able to assess that and so um from that perspective, um, the awareness of Agua is there in, in the public space or within the business community. But one thing that we found um, just lacking was the aspect of the handholding, whereby um, after you've done the training uh, for them, for instance, when we did um, these workshops for those in the test house and apparel, they'll come, they'll tell you that they are very interested. But then when it comes to uh, trying, trying to assess the there's readiness of the factory of the company because when you want to export um there are certain guidelines there are there are certain basic um there's a standards that have to be met and unfortunately um, um our smes on are unable to um, um, meet those standards and that would require time and also patience and other technical assistance for those in the apparel and also textiles and industries it's actually capital intensive, and so if you don't have the, the needed uh, this capital injection, um, you are unable to access or benefit a whole, a, a whole lot. Uh, if you take this company, Dignity DTRT, unfortunately, they were able to have that structured uh, this collaboration or partnership, and so um, they have been able to utilize 
um, the opportunity that comes with um, Agoa by being able to you know have that uh, there's a factory lines to be able to get your produce get your patterns over time and then um, um, does it have line productions unfortunately um for those in the apparatus there are a few of them so these SMEs would have to be able to work um in um, in groups trying to produce line production uh, the products for these big companies and so that is where um uh, i would say for the customers and so currently what we are doing as a chamber is that uh, just given the experience that we've had in organizing these capacity building workshops and then also skills training you know, um, we are going a step um, the further to be able to understand the businesses themselves and then be able to help them scale up your operations and then be able to help them um, assess market so i'm actually happy that you said you are the consultants um for the agos and, and the markets in africa and elsewhere and so these are the new projects that we are doing now if you take um, agua as a whole um, it's helped um, ghana a lot um, if you should take how we started as, as a country and where we are now um, um we would see that over the past five years um um, um, um this growth in revenue has increased from um, this 114 million in 2017 to almost 140 million in 2019. So in terms of the revenue, Agua has been able to contribute th that much to our um, 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 export revenues. Um, however, when the pandemic hit, major issue was the supply chain disruptions and so as i speak now businesses are now trying to recover and unfortunately um, as a country now we are facing uh, um, the, the global uh, food prices also global inflation is impacting on our currency such that the uh, cd is now trading around 10.5 so if you are a, a, a business and then you are sourcing your materials and you are paying in addition dollars then you know that this is a real risk that you need to find ways and means to hedge your supplies. And so um, I would say uh, for us as a chamber, we actually committed in trying to help our businesses grow and find more sustainable ways um, to help them yeah, secure markets and then to be able to improve um, this in their competitiveness. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that thorough response where you talked about through the trade hub, your collaboration also with the trade hub to help the SMEs access the US market, but also the uh, key point about providing that technical assistance, kind of the step by step guide to help them to understand the process and to be able to, ex to access the US market and then also to scale up. Uh, and so you just mentioned with with a lot of the things going on in the global economy now that's having an impact on Ghana and many countries around the world with the inflation, the increased food prices, the supply chain disruption. But could you speak to you gave some figures in terms of what that trade looked like uh, where you saw an increase in trade. But prior to the pandemic and everything that we're especially seeing this year, can you talk about what a goal meant for the larger Ghanaian economy overall, as as well as industry growth. Because I notice you keep talking, you you um, I keep hearing about apparel, which I know is one of the industries that real textile and apparel that uh, really benefited from Agoa. So if you could talk about the economic growth and the in the industries that you have seen benefit from Agoa in Ghana. Thank you very much. Um, so. If you look at the data, or, or if you should focus on the Agua website, you will see that um, key industries um, that, that, that are benefiting from Agua include oil and gas, um, the primary metals, transport, um, apparel, and accessories. We also have chemicals and also um, just related products. Then we have the agricultural uh, products, and then also food and, and this kindred. Now, if you go back to the time now we started um, Agua, 
um, in, in the year 2001, um, um, this value of Agua or this exports uh, for Agua was 20 billion. And then it increased to your 65 billion in 2007. And thereafter, we reached a peak in 82 billion dollars uh, in 2008. Um, if you check from that year, 2001, and also to 20, 2008, um, exports from Agua countries um, um, actually um, increased that of the US um, imports, which helped these countries to get more trade um, um, surpluses to improve on their economic growth and also development. But if you check the data itself, largely the revenues are coming from oil exports. And so that is that, that. But if you come to Ghana, um, as I did uh, just mention, um, we, we also saw, I, I did some work um, on, on Agua, and then I found out that um, as a country, right, we, have, we haven't been able to contribute to 1% of global Agua exports. And so the, the, there is a need um, for us to increase um, the level of technical assistance in terms of policy speed. And I'm glad that the government and this current administration has focused its attention on trying to ensure bottom up policy development for SMEs. So the one district, one factory, which is meant to provide special um, um, this distribution and also growth of businesses is key to sustaining the industrial base of the country. Now, um, if we um, take um, Agoa, it has been able to generate employment. For instance, if you take the apparel and textiles um, in industry, the, the, the reason why I use them is that they have a long chain of um, um, this value addition and also long chain of employment. Because for instance, if you are um, um, this is sewing a shirt, there are various parts of the shirt that have to be sewed, and then you need several um, several um, your yeah, sewers that would come together to sew. So that the direct employment and also the in the direct employment is very huge. And then the last thing that I would say is that um, that the, there are prospects for us to increase. And if you check the recent um, this is data by the Ghana Exports um, um, this Promotion Authority, um, the this value of exports in the year 2017 increased from 11 million to 23 million. So that tells us that Ghana has a very huge potential or has that edge in apparel exports. And so there is a need that we need to continue. However, we also need to diversify our base such that it's not only a barrel export that we are excelling, but we also doing well in terms of the processed and then also semi-processed foods, as well as the art. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that response. So since we're, we've been talking about apparel, my next question is for George. With regard to, because I think it's something important that we need to clarify, with regard to apparel exports, there are certain provisions or criteria that apparel exporters from the eligible sub-Saharan African countries must meet in order to access the U.S. market. So you, can you talk about those, the criteria specifically for apparel, and then if there are any requirements for any other products that we must be aware of, what are the requirements for exporting products from AGOA eligible countries to enter the U.S. market duty-free and quota-free? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, in terms of uh, apparel, uh, there are two levels of uh, uh, eligibility requirements. One at the enterprise level, and then two at the national level. At the enterprise level, uh, any apparel product that is entering the US market must qualify in terms of the material that was used to produce that apparel. One, that material fabric or yarn must have been produced from US. 
Um, if that is not possible, then it must come from uh, another AGOA eligible uh, country. If that is also not possible, then the provisions allow the uh, raw material to be sourced from any other country, what you call the third country provisions. Now, having satisfied that, then at the national level, uh, there must be what we call a robust system that will enable the export to move directly to US. That is what we call the AGOA visa system. The AGOA visa system is meant to prevent transshipment. It is also meant to prevent a diversion of trade that will also divert benefits to non-eligible uh, country. Um, in terms of non-AGOA product, one, it must meet what you call the minimum value addition, which is a uh, 35 percent. Now, once you have <clears throat> this uh, requirement, the other requirement is just the normal standards that you would need to uh, meet in terms of uh, quality standards, uh, FICO, and other requirements that you would need to meet. Uh, from the, the side of the US, uh, the Agua importer for APRA will have to uh, apply and complete what you call uh, customs form uh, 7501. And there is also a D category within the uh, customs entry form. Once you complete the form 7501, and then you indicate category D, it simply means that uh, it is coming from an our country that has put in a robust visa system that would uh, enable US to monitor the movement of the items from Ghana to US. As of now, we have an electronic visa system which enable US customs to monitor the movement of the cargo from Ghana to any other uh, port in US. So uh, that is one. Then the requirement is that the enterprise, the exporter must be able to keep record of all the imports, record of all the input that have gone into it for at least uh, two years to enable US authorities to verify any time there is uh, any incidence of breaches of provisions. These are generally the key uh, provisions that you will have to meet in terms of rules of origin requirements for our benefits. Okay, well, thank you so much. And so key term rules of origin. So that's an important point for exporters from the GOA eligible countries, including Ghana, to really understand what are the specific eligibility requirements for that particular product entering the US market. And then George, also thank you so much for sharing the information for US importers that are taking advantage of a GOA where they can bring in products into the US duty free and quota fee free, but also to understand what are the documents that they need to fill out and the process for maintaining records so that they can definitely prove that they imported these products from an AGOA eligible country in order to benefit from the duty free and quota free imports. So thank you so much for that key point. Now, my last question goes to both Julius and George. Now, Julius, I know earlier in your comments, you mentioned an example of a company that did very well from a GOA. So I, but I would like to throw that out again, some case studies. If there's another example of a company that did well with respect to a GOA from Ghana and how they were able to increase their exports and grow their revenue by accessing the U.S. market. And George, also, if you have a case of a company that uh, took advantage of a GOA and was able to successfully access the U.S. market and do so over the long term, I'd appreciate any examples or case studies that you would like to share for our audience. Um, so I'll let George um, just go for it and then I'll come in. Okay. And if you could just add uh, lessons learned, key lessons learned from those examples. 
for the benefit okay. of the audience. Okay, um, but uh, as also part of the uh, legality requirements, um, countries are enjoined to uh, observe non-application of prison labor, non-application of child labor, and also ensure that uh, there is adequate uh, provision of basic amenity for workers that are working in any uh, agua, any facility that is producing for agua. Maybe this might not be a national requirement, but uh, something like uh, um, business association requirements. Now, um, in terms of case studies, Julius indicated uh, a company by name uh, Dignity Do the Writing. Dignity Do the Writing is a woman owned uh, enterprise that started exporting garment to the US, maybe in suitcases at the very rudimentary end. But it persevered, uh, sought technical assistance, uh, also sought uh, support from uh, US government and also support from Ghana government. And uh, as we talk now, uh, it's been able to train young women, giving them employment. At the moment, they are employing about close to 4,000 uh, workers. 80% of them, young women, um, they are doing roughly close to 20 million US dollars. And so it's a success story of uh, an enterprise that has persevered and then move over from a very grassroots now to a top level. Uh, it has rebranded itself as it used to be uh, Salmon garment, but it are now going to dignity do the writing. The key point here is that if you're able to do the writing, meet the requirements, meet the specifications, get the packaging right, uh, the, the labeling everything right, then you stand the chance of competing once you take advantage of the provisions contained in the AGOA legislation. Um, so I would add that um, um, as a chamber, um, this, we have identified some of our member firms and also manufacturing companies um, that um, are seeking to leverage um, um, in Agoa. So somewhere 2018 and also 2019, um, we embarked on um, Agoa Expo program in this New York, where we um, brought in um, about 20 businesses. Um, to showcase their products. Um, so we have one um, company that I remember by name, uh, Dr. Nina. Um, um, it's actually herbal drink that he produces. So we helped um, get market, but um, um, unfortunately when these things are done, they do not get back to us to let us know whether they've been successful or not. And so we are unable to track which of our members are actually doing the export. We, I, I'm, I'm personally also in the known, um, this company, HPW Fashion, right? Um, it's a, a this in Swiss um, owned company that is at there. So they produce um, this in dried fruits for exports. And um, I'm told or I'm informed that um, they've started their own process um, to get um, the market in the US where they will export and their dry foods already they are exporting to um, this Europe and other um, yeah, this Europe. And so they are trying to get new export markets. And, and I'm sure um, no time that they, they should be hitting um, this new products um, in the US. But one thing we found out is that yeah, um, there are some um, businesses that, that are um, trading on the agua, but we enjoy the duty free quota fee and um, actually requires that you produce in scale as in scale. And so if you are not producing that large quantities, then means that you you will not be enjoying even though your products um, um, are deemed agua and eligible. So there are those that 
do the normal um, this, um, delivery by air uh, based on the quantities that they have. And so we are trying to help them to, to, to scale up um, yeah, their, their, their operation such that they can enjoy the, 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 the duties, um, the free duties, and then also the opportunities that are of. And we are actually open um, to actually collaborate um, in identifying these SMEs that need that support to scale them up and then share the success story with all the data are interested. Okay, well, thank you very much. So from the cases and, and the discussion, the key thing that stood out for me also was not just about the companies where they access the U.S. market and can grow their revenue, but also the benefit in terms of increasing employment. So that's an important takeaway. And then uh, Julius, thank you for mentioning that point, because I know that is one of the issues of getting companies that are able to scale and export larger quantities so that they can really leverage or really take full advantage of a go up. So having, I'm gonna build off of your last point about companies sharing their story, but before I open up the conversation, I just wanna say, well, these are all of my questions and I want to thank our panelists once again for this great insight, very useful information, and you can follow up with them afterward if you have any questions. So thank you so much, George Fenn, the Trade Policy Director for Feed the Future, Ghana Trade and Investment activity and Julius Bradford Lamptey with the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry for, such, for sharing such detailed and useful information about the African Growth and Opportunities Act. And I'm pretty sure that many people on the call have been getting some uh, chat messages here that they found this information very beneficial. So thank you. Now I'd like to open up the conversation by asking if anyone in the audience has used AGOA to export to the United States and to share any lessons learned from that experience that may be useful to others in the virtual room. So, so let's see here, got any hands going up? Okay, if you could, uh, raise your hand or let me just kind of scroll through the chat. Let's see if you, okay. If not, then we can go ahead and open it up for questions. Let's see, Ruby, if you can help me with the questions. I did see some come through during the discussion. Oh, let's see, here we go. I think I have it. And if I miss any, please let me know. But I okay. see one question here. Or I thought it's okay. Uh, from Isabella Esanti. What is the eligibility requirement for food and beverages, especially cocoa powder beverages, both sweetened and non-sweetened? Thank you. And I guess that's for either of the panelists. George or Julius, whichever one wants to take that question. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry, George, go ahead. Uh, uh, the, uh, it's an interesting question, but uh, such a question is best answered or best answered when, uh, because it's all based on the specific uh, export or market requirement in terms of uh, what would be the sugar level, what to be certain specific additives that go up. But having said that, um, the requirement is that you must meet the USMDA uh, standard requirements. Uh, if it is in Ghana here, you must also have received the normal approval by, by Ghana FDA and then also met the Ghana Standard Board Authority standard requirements. These are the basic ones that you would have to meet. The other ones are the, the standard uh, customs export requirements. You will just be required to uh, register. It is, it is also not entirely mandatory, but uh, it is important you have to register with the uh, Ghana Export Promotion Authority. Uh, it is also the usual norm to register with the chamber because the chamber will be issuing you with the 
some other certificates that will be accompanied. So apart from the normal mandatory and regulatory requirements, these are the basic requirements that you will be uh, able, you should be able to meet. You should, we also have what we call the Ghana labeling or Ghana labeling laws, which is also consistent with the US uh, labeling laws. So once these uh, mandatory requirements uh, are met, you should be able to export uh, to the US. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. Uh, there is a question from Bernard, and I'm going to pronounce this as best I can, or Oduro Boateng. And the question is, what is the criteria for the yam export and where do you obtain your certification in Ghana? Thank you. Um, because yam is an agricultural produce, uh, you have to uh, meet the SPS requirements, which is the sanitary and the phytosanitary uh, requirements, just to ensure that you you avoid exporting pests and disease to the U.S. It must be uh, wholesome. There is not uh, much requirement because yam is a natural product. We call it a growth or wholly produced product from Ghana. So once you are able to satisfy the SPS requirements and uh, you are able to go, so uh, yam is not an industrial product. It's a natural product. So the regulatory requirement uh, is pretty straightforward, except the SPS requirement. You would need to go to uh, Plant Protection and Regulatory Services Division, that is PPRSD of the Ministry of Food and Agri. They are located, where are they located? Pukwase. Right. So uh, we can give that person a reference uh, to go there and then uh, he or she will be duly assisted. Okay, great. Thanks so much. And I saw a hand up and uh, Wadara, where you have a question in the chat, but I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Dauda Abdullahi. I'm the manager of uh, Wadata Uniform. Now, my question is, um, what is the um, the level or the amount of the, the quantity of the, uh, the that exempt you from um, uh, enjoying the agua exemption? I mean, when you are talking, you talk about the large quantity before you can enjoy the the agua duty exemption. What is the, the amount? If you can get me. Um, so thank you very much um, for your question. Um, I think the point that, 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 that I was making is that um, if you are producing a few items and then you would want to ship them, then um, in terms of cost-wise, you would have to um, evaluate. So that that point I was making was um, to, to be able to maximize the benefit thereof. Um, it's it best that you produce in large quantities so that you, man, um, you maximize the, the, the benefit um, associated with the duty-free and then also quota-free access. Because currently, I know some um, some um, some um, um, this one to the art and craft, and then they um, they just um, after they do the production, um, they do the deliveries um, via plane, or they give it to someone and then they take it over there. So that that, that, that is um, the case I was making. So the, 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 there is no quantity um, that that is required to um, for you to enjoy duty free quota. The, the point is that once you are in Ghana or your business is in Ghana and then you are producing from the country and then your product is deemed agua eligible as mentioned by Mr. Finn. When you are completing the exports, the, the, the certificate of origin and then you, you the input the D over there, then that means that that product will not pay the due 
um, this in duty when it's going through our ports. But if you are not doing the export, uh, um, if you are not transporting it by our ports, then um, th th there is no duty and um, um, benefits thereof. All right, and uh, if anyone else too wants to raise your hand, I put a question in the chat just to make sure that I don't miss anyone. But just in the meantime, I see that there are also questions regarding chocolate and citrus exporters. And George, maybe you want to repeat, I know you talked about with uh, food products, certain types of products. So if you want to just ex repeat your response as it applies to chocolate and citrus to answer those questions. Oh, you're, George, you're on mute. I don't, oh, I will, yeah, I will start with the chocolate. Uh, chocolate is a, a food item, it is a processed item. And, and so there are very strict uh, sanitary regulatory requirements right from here in Ghana. Uh, to do that, you will be required to have uh, Food and Drugs Administration uh, conducting a thorough inspection of your production facility. And so your production facility must first be approved. Then the product itself must also go through a full safety approval. Once this is done, then uh, you will then ensure that the other side has also uh, ensure that the test sample that you, the, the exporter must have sent also meets US uh, food administration requirements. These are the basic requirements because it is a processed food items. Once you have this, then uh, you only process your order and then that is it. So it is essentially a food safety requirement that an exporter would have meet. Okay, I'm going to take two more questions here. One is a question about a sector that oft, we don't talk about a lot when it comes to international trade, but it, it, it's um, a, a, a pretty good question that um, it says, are there any provisions for service providers in the IT industry? So what, what does the goal mean for service providers, if anything at all? Um, uh, it's still an integral part of um, uh, uh, of AGOA, but it comes under trade in services. Here in Ghana, there used to be a data processing center that used to do uh, data entry for uh, U US fans. And uh, that is separate from trading goods. So, uh, to that extent, uh, Agua cuts across both trade in services and then trade in goods. But trade in services have their own uh, customs regulatory I mean, requirements because it is not part of the, the same trade. I mean, it goes through, so it comes under uh, a different uh, regulatory regime referred to as trade in services. But yes, AGOA uh, seeks to promote trade in services and uh, this exchange of professional services between Ghana and eligible uh, sub between US and eligible sub Saharan African countries. Great, thank you so much. And one question uh, Does anyone have an update on the status of AGOA in Ethiopia? And uh, we had that we mentioned that earlier. So Ethiopia still has lost its AGOA status. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I Okay, and then the last question, this is a, uh, that I want to make sure uh, gets answered. Does AGOA provide support in acquiring new buyers or partners in the United States? 
<coughs> AGOA, I mean, provides a lot of uh, technical assistance through the various uh, trade hubs and uh, through uh, AGOA support. We have the AGOA Resource Center located here in Accra uh, with uh, Julius Agawan in charge to provide uh, support services to those who would want to uh, venture into export under uh, AGOA. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And in the interest of time, I see other questions coming through. I definitely would encourage everyone to reach out to our panelists and ask your questions, take advantage of the resources that they shared with you with the different organizations that provide the support, the technical assistance, so that you can learn more about AGOA and potentially take advantage of this important program in the near future. So thanks once again to our panelists. And as I close out, I just want to say thank you so much, Ruby Golo and the Global Chamber Accra for inviting me to participate and moderate this discussion. Again, I am Dr. Sarita Jackson with the Global Chamber Los Angeles and President and CEO of GRIT. And now I will turn it over to the Global Chamber CEO, Doug Brunke for closing remarks. Dr. Jackson, you're amazing. Thank you for a great moderation. Excellent information. And I had missed the Ethiopia news. I see it now online. And so thank you to our speakers, uh, George and Julius, for sharing. I, I think I found both of you in LinkedIn, but uh, definitely recommend everybody connecting there as well. Thank you, Ruby Agolo, for pulling this information together. This is such a great program. Um, and I think it's great on two levels. Number one is I'm a very strong believer in Africa um, and the, the future of exporting and developing an, an export mentality from Africa. And I, I definitely want to see that happen in an accelerated pace over the next several years and couple decades that I'll be involved uh, with Global Chamber. So let's see what we can do to do that. AGOA aims to provide assistance to do that through the duty free program. Someone asked about what about contacts and connections and other things on that on that, on that end. And Baco, who is, uh, I think, on the line as well, is very familiar with that world. He's also on the Global Chamber Los Angeles Advisory Board. He exports uh, products, including uh, hibiscus from uh, Nigeria uh, to the United States very successfully. So congratulations on your work there. Um, th to get the connections there, speak to Baco and then speak to Global Chamber. Those are some of the things that we can help and assist with. So we encourage you to connect up with Ruby and Dr. Jackson and others that are involved with Global Chamber here to not just know what to do, but then make the right connections to be able to successfully get to the next level. It's critically important, not just for your own business and your own prosperity, but on a macro level, it's so important for us to do more trade because it helps uh, everyone. Thank you again, um, Ruby. Would you like to make any final uh, comments? Thank you, Doc. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jackson, for your time today. And uh, many thanks to our panelists as well for their time and insight. Uh, we do have some announcements, so I'll pass it on to um, our Deputy Director, Ingrid. Um, I just want to um, say to the audience, those that were not able to answer their questions, I mean, our doors are open. Feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to make the right connections for you. Thank you, Ingrid. So good day, everyone. Hope today's webinar was helpful and informative. Indeed, it was to me, as it has given me an insight of the assistance uh, businesses can benefit from 
in uh, different regions and this is what makes the global chamber special we are always choosing practical topics that improve economic relations however I agree with Ruby, this topic uh, should be followed up as many of the SMEs joining today still have many doubts and, and questions. I would like to encourage you all to take a step further and contact us, the Global Chamber Accra, in case you are planning to expand your business. If your company is interested in entering the West African market, do not hesitate to contact us, Global Chamber Accra, and we will be very happy to provide a customized high-level business agenda that enables you to prospect the market as well as uh, connecting with potential clients, suppliers, or partners. On the other hand, if you're a West African company willing to enter the US market, uh, we have designed a four sessions mentorship program that will help you understand the market varieties, your sectors opportunities, how to market your business and to connect with key players within your industry. Uh, you can contact us, uh, whether Ruby or myself, and we will be very happy to have further discussions. I am going to leave my email address in the chat box, so do not hesitate to reach us and have a lovely and beautiful day ahead. Thank you, Ingrid. Officially, we are closed, but those of you who want to stay for a few minutes, uh, five minutes, we'll stay on and then maybe interact with you. Thank you all for joining today. We'll see you next time. We we'll meet every last Tuesday of the month. And so um, our next um, event will be a cross metro event with the London Chamber. Um, and so please uh, put it in your diary to be 25th of October and same time, which is 2 p.m. See you all and um, all the best with your businesses. Thank, Thank you, Ruby. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone Thank interested you. in asking any questions, we are here to help. <laughs> I would like to talk to you directly and Julius, uh, maybe um, it's, it's, it's the time for us to think a little bit further because if we realize on the, you know, the kind of questions that they have been uh, raised, I really do believe we should do a follow up on, on, on most of our SMEs here in Ghana. I agree. Julius, did you catch that? Yes. Hello, can I ask my question, please? Yes, please <laughs> go ahead, so William. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't ask my question in the chat box, but it was not uh, reacted to, please. Go ahead. I did ask the question that, yes, um, I'm a cassava processor. How would um, go through the USDA certification to get market penetration in the US market. Um, so thank you. So on your question, um, um, it's it's blah, 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 one of the um, uh, this daily tasks I, I I get to meet every day. Um, in that, what we do, the beauty about Agua is that it's just providing you with the tool, the access, and the platform. So to be able to get to the US market. Now it's up to you as um, the, the business or operator to identify stakeholders um, that would be able to help you. And so in the, for instance, the chamber um, has it uh, at the connections um, um, via the Ministry of Trade and Industry, their trade attaches and other credible partners in the, that we can leverage um, to help you um, to secure markets um, in the US or, or as well to get um, this potential um, 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 bias. But th th there's also the part that you would have to play where you do your due diligence and then you also do your background checks uh, uh, and here and there. And I'm, I'm also sure, um, this is Sarita also, that's a consultancy work. So these are the connections that you can get once you associate yourself with business and associations such that they help you to achieve your business goal. 
Yeah, I would like to add to that. William, if my contact information is in the chat, and if you would like to speak one on one, because that is one of the things, uh, as Julius mentioned, AGOA is a tool, but as far as the practical side on the US, I have worked with companies within the last couple of years that need assistance with understanding the USDA regulations, the FDA regulations, and if relevant, even EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency regulations. So my firm partners with organizations, with other consulting firms that includes the attorney, people that work for these agencies, whether uh, they are attorneys, scientists, depending on, you know, whatever your product is, that can help to make sure that you the process for getting certified is moves smoothly that you don't have to keep going back and forth you know by not necessarily having everything in order and then also i partner with individuals that can help i help find buyers but as far as if you need distributors to get into to help get your product distributed throughout the us market or agents we have people who actually provide you with the list of distributors and agents, but it's not just the list, they will actually vet them. So it, it is a, an in-depth process, a research process on that end to make sure that you are connected. They'll make recommendations based on their research to make sure these are viable distributors and, and do that due diligence for you. And so if you want to talk, we can talk more about the actual process for getting into the U.S. market and then making sure that your product competes in the U.S. market, identifying the right demographics so that you can you know, succeed over the long term. So let's connect afterward. And then I see Bright has a hand up yeah. question. Yeah. Good morning. Um, I'm speaking from Virginia, and uh, I also run uh, Achiever Force Limited in Ghana. But I'm here to get some market for my products. And uh, I have a question also regarding the registration. And I just took the, the email address of Ingrid to contact for the mentorship because uh, I touched down about 10 days ago, and I was privileged to have my product accepted into some of the African shops. However, I have a big deal from ShopRite in Philadelphia, and they would like to stock my products on the shelf. I have my products registered with the Ghana FDA, but I'm yet to do the registration in the US. So I think I really need a mentorship to know how to get access into the certification process in the USA so uh, I can uh, easily get my products into the market here. Thank you, Bright. Ingrid will look out um, to, to, to you know, take this forward with you. All right, thank you. Okay, on that note, any other questions? Otherwise we'll close the curtains. <laughs> thank you all for your time. We appreciate you. We look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, Enjoy your week. Bye-bye, everyone. Uh, Ruby, Ruby, before you close, um, can you read uh, the message from uh, Rachel? Rachel, okay. Do you have it yeah, open? Rachel, yeah, Rachel, if you are there, can we Rachel, chat are you privately? There? I think she is. Rachel, can you hear us? Or maybe we can talk to Cesar. We will probably oh, she says her be speakers able. Are not working, so. Uh, can um, you put your contact and then we can talk to you? We can call this? you, yeah. Yes. If you if you want to give your contact privately, it's not a problem. Uh, yes. Whether to Ruby or to me, we are one, so it's not a problem. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Thank you. Okay, we will take it from here. Do we have others with pressing issues that need to be addressed? Oh, I think we have somebody from the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Um, hello, sir, madam. Um, the floor is yours if you want to say some few words. I'm not too sure who it is. Uh... It's Rachel. All right. Okay. Good. So we will call you Rachel. Okay, everyone. Very nice seeing you here. Bye bye. Have a lovely see, afternoon. Uh, Madam evening. Agnes from Ghana Export Promotion Authority. Thank you, ma'am, for joining. Uh, we, we had a privilege of meeting a lot of your members join us today. We appreciate that. Um, thank you very much. I was in another meeting, so I thought I would just uh, join in, even if it's a minute late. But as you can tell, we did send it to a lot of our members. So I'm happy to see a lot of them still online. So thank you very much, Ruby. You're welcome. And we're happy to help them as much as possible so they can um, assess the U.S. market and indeed other uh, countries that we, we have um, presence in as well. So we do appreciate your partnership. We are also available to help you do any follow-ups that might arise from this um, particular event. We are available. Okay, very well received, thank you. All right, on that note, I say goodbye and uh, have uh, enjoyed the rest of your day. Cesar, are you there? I think we can close the section.